Good afternoon. Um, almost the end of the day. I will try to keep this interesting for you. In order to do that, one of the first things I've done is create a rule, a law, because I noticed, you know, people have like Pareto's law and Occam's razor, so I thought I would create one of my own here for data and criminal use of data. So I spent a lot of time around criminals and terrorists over my career in law enforcement, and it's taught me quite a bit about the way that they think, and they think differently from most of us. And uh, they, however, can often be quite, quite clever. So for you guys, I would put this out there. Those of you working in big data, the more data you produce, the happier the criminals are to receive it and consume it. And in fact, they're doing quite a bit of it. Uh, big data is big business for organized crime. Organized crime is a $2 trillion a year business. Uh, if you count things like money laundering, trafficking in human beings, the narcotics trade, cybercrime, etc., etc., And when you add it all together, it actually turns out to be 15% uh, of global GDP, if you can believe that. Uh, in terms of big data, the big data that's stolen, 85% of the big data that is stolen is in fact taken by organized crime. So I like to go back in history and talk about a famous criminal by the name of Willie Sutton. How many of you have heard of Willie Sutton, the famous bank robber? And when people asked Willie Sutton why did he rob banks, what, what did he respond? Where the money is. Because that's where the money is. Where's the money today? Data, right? And therefore, people are going after it. People are going after the data in order to uh, profit from it, particularly organized crime. So there's data everywhere. Big business is struggling as to how they can use this data. And as big, big, as big business struggles on how to use it, in fact, the criminal underground has already figured out a variety of systems to take advantage of illicit and illegal data. What type of data are they going after? Pretty much all the data you would expect and some you might not. So they're going after credit card details and banking details. They're going after medical data. There's a fair amount of medical fraud that's committed. Uh, your social data is great for the criminal underground. And as we saw recently in the UK, they're even going after voicemail data, right? Just voicemails, SMS, all that stuff in the news of the world scandal. And all of that has a value on the open market. How do they get the illicit data? How does organized crime go after getting it? There are two main ways. Number one, malware, computer worms, viruses, trojans, and the like. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And the next big way they go after it is social engineering. So they'll send you a phishing link. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen this, where they ask you to click on this link, and then they take you to a fake bank account uh, and ask you to open it up. There actually is a market in stolen data. And if you look at the prices of things, it varies, but the return on investment for data theft is actually quite good. So $10 for a stolen credit card with a $25,000 limit. Uh, I know we have some financial guys in the audience, this being New York, that's a pretty good return on investment, right? Seems pretty good. $700, a bit more expensive, but from that you can get a bank account with $82,000 guaranteed in it. So the value proposition for going after data is great. Another way to determine the value in this is the fact that organized crime is mounting significant operational offensives going after data around the world. And when you look at the malware, the fact is that there are two million new and unique pieces of malware that are released and identified every month. Okay? Two million. And according to Semantic, there are 286 million in circulation. Organized crime would not put the effort into creating all of this malware if it wasn't worth their while to steal your data. Many of you, of course, will know the Sony hack that occurred uh, earlier this year. 700 million accounts, uh, 77 million, sorry, 77 million accounts were compromised in that. They got uh, users' passwords, names, home addresses. They got credit card and purchase history. And as a result of that, the fallout for Sony was great. They saw their share prices drop, and they had a lot of uh, upset customers as a result. 
Of course, the Sony hack wasn't the only hack. In fact, it's not even the largest hack. Uh, the Heartland payment system was the biggest criminal attack going after data to date. They had 130 million records that were stolen. Uh, TJ Maxx was another big case. So criminal exploitation of big data is something that's ongoing and continuing all the time. Now, I just want to stop for a second and talk about what does that mean? Because in fact, big data and the internet and our interconnectedness is creating big paradigm shifts in crime and policing. So in the old days, if you wanted to commit a crime, you'd take a gun or a knife and you'd stand on the street corner and you could rob one person. Maybe you could rob two people. If you're really busy, maybe you do 10 in a day. A uh, hundred years ago, they used to have train robberies where groups of uh, robbers would take over a train and try to stop the train and, you know, take all the money, pull, make them pull over and take all the money off the train. And they might get a few hundred victims. But now we're seeing cases where 100 million people are becoming crime victims simultaneously. Never in the history of mankind was that possible to rob 100 people 100 million people at the same time. So it's creating a big paradigm shift uh, in the world. There is quite a big underground market and underground economy for stolen data. Credit card details vary in price. You can buy physical cards. You can buy fake and stolen ATM machines uh, for $35,000. So you just put up a fake ATM machine and wait for people to introduce their credit cards. Um, you can rent botnets. Uh, of course, it's better if you rent by the day than by the hour. You get better prices. Uh, and there is a really vast uh, criminal underground that is a full bazaar. And like any other marketplace, the criminal marketplace fluctuates. So it reply and responds to the world of supply and demand. There's elasticity in the market. We actually saw after the Sony hack when 100 million records were dumped on the markets, the price of stolen credit card details dropped. Okay, so the market bottomed out and the criminals were really bummed out about that, which makes me kind of happy anytime they're unhappy. So there's lots of people that want to commit cybercrime, but if you're a budding cybercrime startup, how can you get started in this business? You know, you, there's lots of opportunities, but how do you scale? That's what the VCs want to know when they're backing criminal enterprises. Now, most of them are not, in fact, VC-funded, most. Uh, so how do you scale? <laughs> Uh, in fact, you do it this way. There's crimeware and there are attack toolkits out there. So you, in the old days, you know, in the late 70s and early 80s, you need to be a clever hacker to commit crime and break into systems. Now the entire thing is out there. The entire amount of crime has been scripted. So you just buy a crimeware attack toolkit and release it when it runs like any other piece of software. Crime sourcing is a full supply chain. So there's collaborative data sharing that's occurring across borders. Organized crime groups in different parts of the world are collaborating. There are the hackers, the data brokers, people that provide false and fraudulent documents. There's money laundering and people that receive the stolen goods. We're entering the age of what I call crime as a service, CAS. Services are offered online via underground forms, ICQ chat. They have many business practices that will be familiar to you. There's try and buy, free demos. It reminds me when you go to the mall and they try to give you that little piece of Chinese chicken. Here, have one of these. They do the same thing with stolen data sets. There are service level agreements where they say, we guarantee at least 80% of our stolen credit cards to work for you. You get discounts if you buy in bulk. And I was working a case that I didn't mention, but I have a long career in law enforcement. I was working a case down in Brazil where we saw them distributing crimeware root kits. And in fact, they had had 0800 numbers for tech support and for service. So if your stolen credit cards weren't working, they would send you new ones. Or if you couldn't get the malware to work the right way, they would walk you through how to infect people and create a botnet. This uh, website is from Russia. Say that you want to do an account takeover of an elderly Italian woman, but you happen to be in Romania and you don't speak Italian, you don't sound elderly on the phone. This service based out of Russia will provide you with an elderly Italian speaking woman to do the call for you. So it's a crime call center. For $10 a pop, they will place the call and facilitate your criminal takeover of an account. More and more crime is being automated. Botnets being one example. There's hentai, which is a particular type of Japanese anime porn. Uh, they're scripting the attack. So for people that are into this sort of child 
uh, type pornography, animated pornography. You downloaded the porn. The porn contained malware, which was turning on and off your camera. And as Mr. Yamamoto was looking at fictional child porn on his computer, it was snapping a picture of him. One month later, every time the porn program was activated, it sent a blackmail email sending to the victim all the pictures of him that were taken in various states of undress with his uh, photos and saying, would you like this to go to your boss or to your uh, family? Lots of social data exploits. The world of social data, Andreas Weigen spoke about earlier, but please rob me. You will know about aggregate, aggregating data from um, Facebook and other places. Every time somebody says they're on vacation, please rob me. We'll record that for you. I can stalk you is one better. It looks at metadata and files that you post online in places like Flickr and Picasa, and we'll take the EXIF data and reveal information about you without your knowledge. We're moving from crowdsourcing to crime sourcing, lots of distributed criminality taking place. Co-conspirators don't need to know each other, just come together for the purpose of committing a crime. Flash mobs are becoming crime mobs. Uh, we have flash robs, which are taking place, which uh, mobile phones are allowing people to come together and commit crimes in ways that were never possible before. You can download apps on your iPhone that will help you do surveillance of the police. During the recent London riots about a year ago, there was an application created called Suki, where you can use your iPhone and use the GPS in it to track the police, and it would show you a map of areas that were cordoned off and which ones to avoid. I would like to say that also terrorists are doing really interesting things with data, unfortunately. From the 2008 Mumbai terrorist incident uh, where many hotels were attacked, 163 people were killed, a few hundred others seriously injured. The terrorist organization that carried out the attack was known as Laksha e Toiba, based in Pakistan. And the first thing they did before launching the attack was set up a terrorist war room. So the same way you see this military operations center with all the TVs in the background, Laksha e Toiba did the same exact thing. In Pakistan, before they launched the team to attack India, they had televisions with Al Jazeera and BBC and CNN. And as the attack started to come in, they started to monitor all of this open source data for information that would help them with their attack. Three interesting points about the 2008 Mumbai terrorist attack. I've done a lot of looking at terrorist incidents. I served as an advisor to the United Nations on counterterrorism and specifically looking at terrorist use of technology. And I can tell you that this was the most technologically advanced attack completed by a terrorist organization to date. Many organizations have done things like use Google Earth to try to find, you know, targets to go after. They've used mobile phones before. But what was different about this incident is that the terrorists mined data in real time mid-incident during the attack. So as people were saying on the telephone or, or as the people were talking to the news media, right, the news wants to go ahead and get the story out. BBC is interviewing people. CNN are interviewing people. And as people were saying on the telephone, oh, this is Mr. John Smith. I'm trapped in room 557. They were sharing their stories with the BBC. Terrorist War Room is picking this incident up. They are sending the information to the terrorists on their Blackberries, and the terrorists are moving in to intercept. So a real-time feedback loop to kill more people and commit better terrorism. And I know this because I've listened to the intercepts and you can actually map it out, the timing of the incident. Another thing that occurred, um, Twitter became a big part of the, f the theme that was going on there. The Mumbai terrorist attack, phenomenal how quickly things happened. Within 20 minutes of the incident, there was already a Wikipedia page up on the attack. As tweets were coming out, they, they went up to about a thousand a minute, and some of them were tweet picks. One of the things that happened is the Nariman House, which was the Jewish community center in Mumbai that was attacked, as the counterterrorism forces from India were going to land on the roof, somebody took a photo, they tweet picked it. The tweet pick was uh, sent out and picked up by the BBC. The BBC broadcast it, the terrorist war room picked it up, and minutes later, seconds later, there was a phone call to the terrorists letting them know that the Indian counter assault forces were landing on the roof. The terrorists were instructed to reposition themselves and were able to kill Indian counter assault forces as they were coming through the door down from the roof. And the last thing that they did was mid-incident, as they were finding hostages, they went into one uh, hostage's room, kicked down the door, 
asked him who he was. He was in a suite at this hotel, the Taj Mahal. He claimed, I'm just an innocent school teacher. It didn't make sense to folks that that's in fact who he was. So the terrorists Googled him. The terrorist war room used open source data, and this is what we heard on the intercept. Oh, is he a heavyset chap, bald in front, wears glasses? Yes, we found him online. Kill him. Okay? So as you're thinking about your social media profiles and you're wondering about privacy, there are a lot of other things to consider. So coming back to the main point, the more data that you are willing to produce and share with the world, knowingly or unknowingly, the more criminals, organized crime, and terrorists are willing to take advantage of to use against you. I thank you very much for your time and appreciate the opportunity to be here very much. Thank you.